Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Discover Dorico for January. Uh, so, um, this uh, is going to be a session about uh, Dorico 3.1, um, starting big with uh, Marla Symphony number six. Um, hopefully, you can all hear me. If uh, I'll be reading all the comments, so if you uh, if you want to write any comments and say hi, ask any questions, then please do. As always, you can ask sessions in advance uh, of these sessions on uh, our email address, which is discoverdorico at steinberg.de. Um, uh, I, I, I should say hello, to just so you can see a face. And, and you know, I am here, I am talking, and this is a live session. Uh, most of the time, though, I'm not going to show um, me talking to the screen because you want to see what's actually going on on the screen. But my name is John. I'm part of the Dorico team. Um, we have recently launched Dorico 3.1, so Dorico Pro 3.1. But of course, there's also an Elements uh, update for that. And we've launched a new Dorico SE as well. So uh, if you want to try a free version of Dorico now, then download Dorico SE from dorico.com. Um, I have been doing some sessions, for example, at NAM recently about things you can do in Dorico SE and actually how far you can get in that version. But in this particular session, I'm going to be looking at some of the new features uh, in Dorico 3.1, including uh, we're going to start off with some of the condensing changes and that kind of thing. So um, I presume since some people are saying hello on the live feed there that everybody can hear me, please let me know if not. Uh, we've got some people in the UK, hooray! And people all over the world as usual. Welcome everybody. Um, so what I'm going to do in uh, this session, as I said, I'm going to look through some of the new things that are in Dorico 3.1. Um, some of them you may well be aware of, some of them you might have kind of glossed over and gone, is that useful? Uh, what does that do? Um, I'll look into a couple of the finer points of some of the bits, hopefully. Um, and m in, if there are other things that you think, actually, you didn't show this, please show it in another session, then please let me know. That'd be great. Um, uh, of course, you can find out all of the latest information uh, on, on Dorico from our version history document. So if you go to the website or you use the Steinberg download assistant, um, then you can read this version history document and this will tell you this is the latest January 2020 version and you'll be able to find out what all the new things are uh, and what the improvements are and these are the, some of the things that we'll be looking at in this session but if you want to read the detail it's in that version history PDF uh, and the version 3, well now 3.1 version history is now 117 pages but don't be scared you don't have to read all of it but it does have lots of very useful information so here's some of the things that I thought could potentially be useful and you might want to look at the first one is um, in this example here, um, I, was, I was actually given a file, and apologies if you're the person on this live stream who gave me this file in the first place, um, because thank you very much. Um, I can't remember exactly where this came from, so the apologies are I can't remember your name, I'm sorry. Um, but I was uh, given a file which contained a fair amount of uh, all, all this use good, good stuff in this symphony. Um, but what I wanted to do was change some of it so that I could then use it for the uh, condensing feature. So in this score, just so you can see what I've got set up, um, I've got a whole bunch of uh, players down here, including eight French horns, um, and there's a whole bunch of parts on the right-hand side. Uh, I've got actually two scores. I've got a full score, and I've got a, a full score A4, um, obviously using international paper sizes, as I do. Um, so if I switch to the, the, the full score, the, there's no uh, massive difference except what I'm using this version for, this uh, full score, is the kind of uncondensed version, if you like. So that I, this is actually the one I normally work in. And uh, I'll come back to some of the things I uh, have been doing in that, in that particular bit. And then the full score A4 is the version that, in the end, I'm actually aiming to print, really. Um, this is the version with condensing turned on and, uh, and making it fit uh, neatly on the right size paper with all the right instruments. Um, so this condensed version, if I uncondense it, for example, you'll see that it's not going to fit on this size paper. Uh, yes, I have a shortcut I've made myself. So this is kind of my, this is the uncondensed version. Dorico trying very hard, but failing, unfortunately, because there's too much information here. Um, so I've kind of made two scores. There's nothing to stop you making you know, uh, unlimited numbers of scores, but I've got one of the paper size that I want to work on and one of the paper size that I in the end want to print on when I've got the condensing feature turned on. But what I wanted to look at the first is, um, you may have seen in some of the new information, it's talking about um, condensing 
and the fact that you can now set your own condensing areas. Um, so, uh, and there's a new option, so when you're in engrave mode up here, you can set a condensing change. Um, so what we're going to do is look at that. So for example, the just out of interest, the score, the version I'm copying, and uh, thank you very much to um, Frank, who I can see is online, for because uh, he pointed out what some of the differences were because I didn't know. Oh, that's not that's not the right version. That's another version. I've got multiple versions of this one, haven't I? Um, so there's um, this uh, th this version of the file is the one that I'm kind of taking as my inspiration. I'm using English uh, instrument names actually instead of the the German uh, instrument names. Uh, and this is um, uh, an original version where the woodwinds, for example, appear at the beginning, whereas, uh, thank you, Frank, for letting me know that, that that's not the case in the revisions, but I decided I was going to go with this one because it had some useful options in it. Um, so this is the kind of the, the, the idea I'm going for and the, the look I'm going for and the version that I'm copying of this particular file, uh, just as an excerpt and a, an example to see what's going on. So, for example, at the beginning here, you can see that there are four flutes uh, and the label one, two, three, four on these double staves. So in Dorico, if I just move that one out of the way for a second, you see that actually what happens is that by default, it doesn't show you that. What it shows you is it, that it, Dorico can condense all of these down to f you know, um, this way. And you can say, well, I've got it all on one staff because they're not playing at this point. And that's okay. Um, but when you want to show actually, no, I want to force this, then what you would have done in Dorico 3.0 is in the layout options for players and condensing. You could have made a custom condensing group. Uh, so here you can see I've made one for oboe one and two and oboe three and four. So you can just press this button and you could make, for example, uh, a one and two and a three and four for, for flutes as well. The challenge then is that because you've set those uh, condensing groups, you can't then change them later. So if you ever want to go back to a single staff with all four flutes on, then you can't because you've already you've made these groups already and you uh, you can't have unmake them. So actually custom condensing groups can be useful for that kind of thing. So in engrave mode here, you click somewhere at the beginning where because uh, this is where I want the condensing change to be. And instead of using the layout options to make that condensing change, I'm going to go to here in condensing change. I'm going to select the flutes. So because I've not set a default group, I've, I've got a group here with all four flutes in it, but now I can specify what happens to them. So at the bottom, for manual condensing, I can turn this on, and I can say that flute one, and you can drag these over, or you can use this little uh, button here. You can put flute one and flute two together, and then you can put flute three and th flute four together. But if I drop them here, then that will give me a downstem uh, voice. So these two would be in the upstem voice. This would be in the downstem voice for the same staff. And I want a new staff, so I'm going to remove that one. If I press this button here, then I can add a new staff, which will add an upstem voice and flute three into it, and then I can put flute four in there. So now I've got two staves. So when I press OK here, uh, what will happen is the flutes are now, they're, they're on two staves, one and two and three and four, OK? Um, if I turn on signposts, I have a, a shortcut to turn on all signposts. I don't bother with personally, personal option. I don't bother with a, uh, an option just to say turn on individual signposts on and off. You can, you can set a shortcut if you want to for individual signposts. Uh, if there are some you want to keep on and some you don't. But there's also a, a show and hide signpost option at the top. Uh, and I've just set a, a shortcut for that. So I have the same shortcut to turn on all or hide all signposts. Um, let me uh, just check the comments. Yes, uh, Frank, some of them are simply have different versions. They do. And Dorico has different versions. So yes, yes, uh, changing things, hey? You know, who'd have it? Um, so anyway, so you can see here I've got a condensing change, and this is labelled at the top here. So it's saying at this point in the score, all this is telling you is there is a condensing change happening. And you have to double click on it now to find out what that change is away from the norm. So for example, here, I've got all, it's trying to fit all eight horns. We need to do these labels a bit better. We, uh, but we've got all eight horns here on, on one staff. Um, and if we uh, move over later on, then Dorico is saying, actually, at this point, I could condense them in this way onto three staves for you if you want to. Um, and at the top up here, there is a condensing change uh, signpost because I've already added one at this point. So if we double click on that, we can find out I'd actually added one for the flutes at this point. So that the flutes uh, could, could actually, uh, it's the same as what I'd just done at the beginning. Um, so you can see that example in there. But now at this same point in the score, I want to also add one for the uh, the horns. So I'm going to select horns here, 
and tick the little box and add a condensing approach for manual condensing. And I'm going to say this time for the horns, I want one, three, five, and seven. And then on the downstem voice, uh, no, I don't. I want a, a new staff, sorry. And this one I want two, four, six, and eight. So apply that one. So now at this point, there is a condensing change, which is applying to the flute and also the horns. So you see here now the horns have condensed in a, uh, in a different way. So you can set multiple condensing points through the score. Um, now, ideally, Dorico would be just doing the condensing for you, and in many cases, it will. Um, but as I said, this is useful when you're trying to copy a particular example or there's a particular way you want to condense that section. Uh, and then across the top of your score, you'll see these condensing changes. So if I move across here, you see there aren't any on this one, but there is one on this page here, uh, on this um, system here. So if I select this one here and double click on this, you can see here the horns, are uh, they've now have a change here for uh, inactive players can now pair with the active player. And the condensing approach now is that the horns one and three are in the upstem voice and two and four in the downstem voice. So let's just move this out of the way slightly. So you can see there's a, a, a change here. And then four, five, six, and seven, sorry, six, <laughs> five, six, seven, and eight are in staff two. I said, but staff two is not here because staff two is blank. And so the high density staves feature has taken over and said, great, all these horns are all in this extra staff. You don't need that right now, so it'll hide them. So it's condensed all um, eight horns down at this point to, to just one staff, and it's only, needing, it's only showing the ones that you need. So that's a, another condensing change there. We just uh, move on a bit. There's two on this system, so double click on this one. We'll have a look. So here we have a, a, a flute change again, uh, and this is saying a reset. So what's happening here is that Dorico is now condensing the flutes down to uh, all four of them being the same because it's done a reset. So it said there's, there's no manual condensing done here, so you can all go back to uh, just playing the, the same thing all on one system, which is very useful. Uh, there's also a bassoon change, or maybe I was going to add one but didn't. There's a horn change again, so this time we've got all these horns are now in an upstem voice. And these are all in an upstem voice, similar to what we had before. The trumpets have got a change here. And the trombones have a change here. Oh, yes, let's have a look at this one. So, so the trombones here are all in an upstem voice. So let's say, actually, if we turn that off, if we said these trombones don't need to do a, do a change here, let's go and see what happens with this one. So here, you can see this is what Dorico would be doing normally. It would be adding these, and the third trombone it would be giving uh, a, a, an extra stem to, and then here it's going back to uh, A3. Uh, you can also see some player labels here. This is because I've also hidden some of the extra player labels I need. Um, so if we say, actually, we do want to make that change, so if we go to condensing change, trombones, do a condensing approach of manual condensing and just put them all in the same voice. You remember trombone three was using a downstem voice, so now effectively we're overriding that and saying, don't do that, we don't need to, you're all playing the same chord at this point, there you go. So it's made a condensing change at this point, and then it knows uh, these can, it can put together. And you see here, we've got an A3 label twice, um, and what Dorico is doing here is because there's a rest, um, Dorico looks at these uh, condensing areas in, in sections and a rest will split the section. So if you don't want any of these, then in the properties panel, you can use the little hide toggle and you can hide that little change there uh, and you'll get a player label with it as well. So there we go like that. There's a, there's a player label. So uh, let me just have a quick section. Can I select multiple instruments? Uh, no, actually. Mark, you can't drag uh, multiple instruments over together. May maybe it would be nice one day. Um, it may be, in some cases, using the little uh, arrow. I think we're talking about this um, condensing change option here. Um, it may be, you know, you sometimes you feel, if you do manual changing, that you want to kind of select multiples and you can't at the moment. Sometimes using this arrow would be useful. But in the end, you can often end up uh, dragging things around to get them in the right places. So dragging them into the right place uh, in the first place uh, actually is what I often end up doing uh, and dragging them over. So, and here's another change. Let's have a quick look at this one. It's a trombone change again. So actually this is when they've gone back to using uh, a downstem voice. So actually probably a reset would have worked there as well. And that's because there are uh, two voices here. If I just turn off those signposts, you can see we need the two voices again at that point. Um, so that's kind of a, um, a 
a look at some options as to why um yeah why why you might want to do some of these things uh, why you might want to to use um the the manual condensing options to be honest in a lot of cases you you may you may well not need to um but um yeah th that's um yeah um one of those things that you you might find useful so I, that was i thought a useful kind of example of uh, some of these some of these sections some of these cases uh, this is something i'm still working on this particular file as well but um maybe at some point if somebody uh, wants a copy of it then uh, i can also make it available maybe as a because it's just an excerpt and you can have a play with some of those changes um so i'm just going to go back for a second to full score um by the way when i've been working on this project uh, one of the shortcuts i find very useful is uh, alt shift and the square brackets and that's because you can move between scores and parts so if going from the full score to the, the in my case the next full score then going to flute one and then going to flute two you can use um alt shift and the square brackets to then switch between the various various layouts you've got and uh, it's a, a useful shortcut in this case um, also, what I found in this particular piece is that um, w when I was looking at the original and comparing it to the file I had, and as I said, I'd been sent a version with lots of notes in it already. So, um, but in what in many cases, because most notation software, you would have originally started trying to make the condensed version with voices and that kind of thing. Then the file I was sent only had, for example, two oboes. Um, because it was just showing me the two oboe staves that would have been on the score. So they weren't individual parts. So I had already, of course, gone to setup mode, added some extra oboes, dragged those up so they sat in the right order here. Um, but then what I ended up with, of course, was I would end up, for example, if I just uh, revert this, I'd probably end up with something like this, where I, one of the oboe parts would have the, the music in it, but it told me in the score that they were all playing all the, all playing the, 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 the same uh, the same section all at the same time. It was our four in this case. So um, there's a couple of useful things you can do to to then sort these things out. So um, yes, you can make selections and kind of paste over larger areas. But actually, what's been more useful is a couple of a uh, couple of other tools I've used. One is uh, the move up and down. So Alt N and Alt M uh, are already defined anyway, which just moves the music to the staff above or below. I was often finding that the, the music or some of the notes were in the staff just above or just below the one I wanted. And instead of selecting it all, copying it to, you know, and then selecting where I wanted to paste to and that kind of thing, just selecting it and saying move, literally just move to the staff above or staff below was, was very useful in this case. Um, I also then, uh, there is a command for, uh, in here, for paste special, which is not only move to staff above and below, but duplicate to staff above and below. Um, so I've set myself a little shortcut. This is just for this project. I've happened to set a little shortcut for duplicate to staff below. Um, and what that does is when something's selected and I hit that shortcut or use that option in the menu, it will duplicate the information down, um, which can be very useful. And it was also very useful when I was working on the horns because I've got um, uh, eight horns here. Um, and what you would also find sometimes is that because they're not all playing the same thing, um, then it may be, for example, that you, you want to take some of this information and you want to move it down. And if you move and there's also other music in there, then, then it, uh, it doesn't matter. It kind of, you can take it through. So let's say, for example, I needed to put this information here and move it to horn three. Then I can use Alt M. It goes into this staff. It's still all selected, though, and then goes back out again and down to the next staff. So in some cases, that was a useful option. However, also, of course, you can Alt click, you can copy and paste. But I just thought that the move and the duplicate options for this type of work where you're kind of building up things that you then going to condense was very useful so that you could uh, um, move the music around. There are many cases in this one where all four flutes are playing the same thing, for example. So once you've got the first one, the first section correct, copying it down to the other four um, was a, a very quick thing to do with the duplicate to staff below. Uh, the same with the clarinets. I also found that various parts, for example, in uh, in the oboes, um, for example here, that you would have originally had lots of the music kind of doubled up in voices. Um, so let me just see if there's a... Ah, oh no, there isn't. But I'll, I'll use these ones here. So, for example, these notes here, which are, are in the oboes, actually, um, let's say we wanted to, to change some of these. You can select some of these notes and use things like um, filter, um, so there's a filter for um, all sorts of things, 
But the one I have a particular shortcut for is uh, filter notes and chords and bottom note or single notes. Um, uh, there's also one for voices as well, so if you want to filter voices. So if you filter out the bottom note of a chord, then you can use the move down to move it to a staff below. And then if it also needs to be in the staff underneath that, you can then duplicate to the other one. So now you can see here, I've moved that bottom note from, from this one, and I've moved it to the third oboe and then copied it to the fourth one. And that kind of thing can also be a very quick way of, uh, of moving the music around when you've already got some source material in here. Of course, uh, what you can also do in Dorico is, uh, if, if you're entering the music to start off with, you could also split the, um, split the carrot line, so shift down, uh, has extended the carrot line down over these four, and then if you have a MIDI keyboard and you play a chord, it will enter all of the notes at the same time onto all of those instruments. That's also very useful for this, um, and then using the condensing feature to make the score and the condensed version. But of course, the idea at the end is that and the reason condensing exists is that we still have now all four oboe parts. So uh, I haven't looked at any of these for formatting, but uh, looks OK. Um, so you've then got all of the individual parts. And when I get to the A4 version of the score, which is the one I want to print, and when I then turn on the condensing option, which I've set myself a little shortcut for, then you'll get this and where with uh, everything condensed as, as you'd expect it to be. or if you add your own manual changes, then uh, uh, you'll get the everything condensed exactly as you want it to be. Um, and I've mentioned setting shortcuts for things, so very quickly in the preferences. Um, so on a Mac here, it's in Dorico preferences. If you're on PC, then I think you'll find it in edit preferences. Then you can go to key commands, and in here you can search for things. So for example, if you search, uh, search for your bottom, then uh, you can find bottom note or single notes and add a shortcut for that. Uh, there's also various other options uh, in here as well. And uh, there was a the duplicate one that I used as well. Uh, so in the duplicate, uh, don't use that one. Uh, in note editing, you'll find there's a duplicate to staff above and to staff below. So if you want to set yourself any shortcuts for things like that, then that's where you would do it. Uh, let me just check the comments and see if there's any questions about that that kind of thing. Uh, no, uh, there's uh, there's a question about um, elements and uh, moving some items. Yes, you are going to need, uh, in some cases in elements, it, you'll find um, in the edit menu, um, there are some options for uh, things like make into system, uh, I think. Maybe we should do a, a session on elements as well at some point, as well as maybe a, a session on SE and the various options that you can do and, and what you can do in them. In fact, that's, n that's not a bad idea. I was doing uh, lead sheets in SE as well and that kind of thing. So maybe that's uh, an idea for a future Discover session. Um, nothing, I don't think, particularly on the condensing things at the moment. So that's good. I know there's obviously a delay, so if there are any... Uh, questions on that, let me know. Um, also, I didn't point out, but the reason that lots of these notes are grey and some of them are black uh, and you get the difference on here is that I have in the view menu, I have notes and rest colours and there's a condensed music option. And if that's turned on, then you can see that the music is condensed because it's grey. Uh, that means you can't click on it because you can't edit things while they're condensed. You can still edit this one down here because it's not condensed, but I can't select these because they are condensed because obviously you need to uh, uncondensed to, to uh, edit the original one. So that's where I was using the shortcut, either to go back to the other sh other score, so Alt-Shift-Square-Bracket, um, to go back to the other score and working on that one, uh, or I just hit my uncondensed uh, shortcut. Is that a word? Uncondensed? I don't know. Um, I turn off the condensing um, with my shortcut, uh, and then I can work on those particular bits. What you will find is that if you're like me, and sometimes you'd say, I want to play from here, and you click on a note, you can't do that now. Uh, so, oh, I want to click from here. Oh, I can't, but you can click on bar lines. So if you want to play, for example, from here, then you can do. So let's say while you're scrolling through the music, um, you say, you know, I'd like to listen to, I don't know, from three here. Well, look, I can select this. If it's a selectable item and I press P, then I can play from that section. Also, I've just noticed something, so I'm going to draw attention to it, although 
Yeah, should I? I don't know. Um, at this section here, um, the, the reason this looks a bit odd is if I just go back to my uh, full score, um, you can see here I, I've made this correct. Um, what I've done is I've used an extra upstem voice here. So uh, if I right click, you'll see in the voices, change voice, this is what I used. I have two upstem voices. Um, I don't need any downstem voices at this point, I just have two upstem voices. And that's because this I've entered as a, a second upstem voice, um, made it a crotchet a quarter note instead of a half note here. Um, and then I've used remove rests, which is the option in the edit menu over here uh, for remove rests, which I also have a little shortcut for. So I've used that to make this uh, look correct, which is um, this um, double stopped chord here. This obviously is the note that they need to hold on, so that, that's how I notated that particular bit. However, this bit, you'll find that um, there are things like that, which then, the uh, because I had to go to engrave mode, and the original, you would have, if I just open this properties panel here, the original for these notes here was that the voice column index uh, wouldn't have been set. So for, if I select these, if I do this, you, this is what you would have got initially. So I've turned on the voice column index, which has made all of these line up, but it's only doing it in this, uh, in this score. So what I would normally then do is in right mode, I do select all, uh, once I've done a lot of these changes, uh, and I would use the option which is to uh, propagate properties. Uh, so here's propagate properties. Um, and that will then propagate the properties through to the other scores and parts. So with any luck, uh, and I, there's been a few changes and things I've made, so as long as I didn't make any, there we go, any other manual changes, then you get those options. Um, also, depending on the part, in this particular case, and this doesn't actually happen very often, but uh, in this particular case it will, this stem needs to be slightly lengthened, you see? So I've, uh, I have been tweaking a few things as I've been going on. I've been having a lot of fun with this, uh, this project, um, and it also, of course, you know, sounds pretty good. And if you're wondering, I'm actually, I am cheating. I'm using Note Perform with this one. Um, just because I didn't have time to also work on playback. You can make, um, of course, you can make Halion or any other sample library sound very nice, but Note Performer is, uh, um, it's not really a plug, but it is my kind of cheat for, I don't have time to work on playback right now, but I'd like it to sound quite nice. Um, so I've been using that. Um, Noteperformer.com if you want to go and have a look. Um, yeah, I've just read the comments. Um, yes, uh, Frank, possibly, yes, I might have um, got that shortcut for a select bottom note from somewhere. Yes, I'm not sure. Uh, Dan's late to the party. No worries, Dan. This is recorded. You can watch it any time you like. Um, so moving on, moving on, because uh, um, I normally try and keep these sessions in half an hour and I've failed once again. So a couple of other things I'd like to draw your attention to, some of which are uh, in the you know, release notes for things and you can check them out. For example, here in, the, uh, in play mode, we now have this button, which is our dynamics lane, and you can make this bigger if you want to. Uh, and the dynamics lane here is showing me what the dynamics are. So I've got a forte just before these notes start. And then I've got, actually in this particular score, I've got SZ. Um, and I've set in engraving options for dynamics uh, that I've set that uh, SFZ is shown as SF. Um, so you've, you've got an option there as to uh, which way you want to show it. Uh, and then it's showing here in the, in the dynamics lane as SFZ. So you can move these if you want to. Um, so if this isn't quite loud enough, you can drag these points and you can move them and, uh, and tweak the dynamics. It won't affect what's displayed on the score, just for playback if you want to tweak things and the dynamics lane can be very useful to you. Um, maybe we'll do a, a, se a complete session on some of those kind of things later. Uh, one of the other new things, which actually didn't kind of come out as a necessarily a big main feature, but it's when you want to do local chords, and I was asked this several months ago by uh, and actually by a couple of people uh, on email about, I've got these chords, uh, lovely, but uh, the, the guitar part I need to make simpler. I don't need to show A add nine, I want to show a different version of the chord just for the guitarist. And because in Dorico the chords are system objects, um, then you can easily do that. I mean, the useful thing is that because they're system objects, they turn up in play mode, you can make them play back if you want to, uh, and they get added to all rhythm section instruments automatically. But when you want to make a change just to one instrument, how would you do it? So now you can edit this chord, which I've done just by selecting it and pressing enter. And if I change this chord, so let's say we want to make this an A sus2, and hold down alt, alt is often local changes in Dorico, and you'll see this uh, item changes here. So I can now change just this local chord and uh, while well, this one stays the same. 
Uh, so if we want to do the same here, for example, now you see now I've come into here, it knows that we've started making local changes, so it's already changed this icon. So now if I press Alt, I could go back to the global ones. You've got local and global changes if you want to. So Alt is the kind of the switch between them. So uh, let's say on this one, maybe we don't need the base note on that one either, and this one could be another sus2. So you can make these kind of changes. While you're typing the chords in, so uh, let's just say if I deleted these, they weren't there initially, and I've got these. Um, you can also do it by saying um, Alt-L to lock yourself into the uh, local changes mode. So you can t actually type anything you like in, uh, at this point. Um, and so uh, and if you want to go back at any point to actually the, the global changes, then you can press Alt-G for global, and you can go back to the global changes if you need to. So you can switch while you're typing with Alt-L and Alt-G, or you can switch just one chord just by holding down Alt, uh, and then you can make a change either way. Uh, so I think uh, some people will find that very useful. Um, of course, it still hopefully stops you having to copy and paste chords around and that kind of thing, but if you do need to copy chords, if you select a chord, I always use sh uh, select more to select things, but you will find because this is a local one, and these are now uh, global ones that select more isn't going to work for that. But you know you can still drag a selection around things as well. You're only, I, I presume, you're only going to have these local chords occasionally, uh, or it may be that you end up, you know, you want to move these ones in. You can use select more to select those. So select one, select more, select the other ones in the bar. Hit it again. It selects the other ones all the way through the system. Hit it again. It'll select the thing all the way through the flow. Um, the, um, let me just. Are there any? Uh, is a um, uh, the dynamics lane included in a MIDI export? I think it is actually. It will be if you're using, for example, controller eleven for uh, dynamics, then that will be exported in the MIDI export. And um, there is also, of course, uh, a velocity lane. So actually, if you want to use note velocities for anything, then in play mode, uh, in here as well as the, this one, there's also this one, which is your note velocity. So if you wanted to use those, depending on the samples you're using, then you can export the note velocities as MIDI as well. Um, a question about two different scores and showing the scores without accidentals. Uh, we might need to see the music XML file, but it may just be that if you, it depends on the case, it may be that when they've been imported, they've been imported with a property which turns off the accidental. So, for example, here, this accidental is being shown, but there's a property at the bottom to hide accidentals. So if it had been imported with this, uh, what you might just want to do is select all, uh, filter the notes, because it, you can only uh, apply this to notes. So uh, let's say if we just filter all notes and chords, then you can toggle off the accidental property, and that might do it, but it might depend on the case. If that doesn't do it, then uh, Barons Chipper, let me know. Uh, email discoverdorico at steinberg.de and we'll, we'll have a look. Um, Frank says he's not run into the problem. So like I said, it's possibly a particular file something, but you know we can have a look. Um, so another thing I wanted to have a look at, uh, or a couple of little things, and I'll try and make these quick. Uh, there is a new lines option over here, uh, but the well, reason I wanted to highlight this is that these three little items up here can make a difference can make quite a difference as to what's going on. So there's a start and an end. And what we're looking at is where are these lines attached? So for example, if I select some notes here and I've got the notes selected, then when I add some of these, some of these lines are going to go through the note heads because they're probably more commonly used when you don't have the other notes in between and you just want to use some of these items instead uh, to, to kind of highlight things. And so as I select all of these, they're going note attached. Um, let me just delete that one. Um, you can't change these uh, once you've added the, these uh, start and end points once you've added a line. Uh, so that's why I've deleted that one. There's also these ones. So there's one here which says, um, and if you hover over it, it says attached to rhythmic position and attached to bar line. Brackets where available. So for example, if I select, uh, let's say select these notes again and use the bar line option and then do this then it doesn't attach to the bar line because there was no bar line available. It, you know, it, as it said, attached to bar line where available. So if I select the this bar here and I use this option, which is the rhythmic position, 
then you see it's attached at the rhythmic position. You see it's, it's ended before the bar line. If I was to do that but use the bar line attached property, uh, let's say we'll have this one, then you see it attaches one and it does attach to the bar lines. So you get different options here for uh, depending on what you've attached the start and end, and I've done both the same in each case, but you can have different properties for those. Now you can still move these kind of things later if you want to. So for example, if you go into engrave mode, you know you can move some of these properties and move some of these items around, but it, some, it can make quite a difference to where you've attached things. So for example, if you have a note attached line here and it was only going to the next note, then that's okay, because this one doesn't matter. It says bar line, but where available. Uh, and then over here, you can, of course, now edit these and you know put them actually wherever you like. So if you want to change them later, yes, you know, no problem. But you'll often find it easier uh, and quicker to not have to move things around quite so much if you get the start and end points correct to start off with. Also, for all of these items, so when you select items, let's say this one here, there are uh, horizontal line positioning options here. So you can uh, change things, but you can also reverse things. So you can reverse a line. You can have a line body style and change the line body style afterwards. You can have a start cap and end cap and you know continuation cap and that kind of thing. And the useful thing is that these lines, because they know that where they're attached at the begin beginning and end, if they're especially if they're over several bars and you get a system break, then it will know what to do over that system break so that you won't get a line that only appears in one system and, uh, and that kind of thing. So. You can now have a play with those uh, line tools. Um, yes, at some point, I'd love to you to be able to add your own line styles to things and be able to create your own lines. At the moment, that isn't possible, but keep watching this space. Uh, as you know, we like to tweak things and do different versions, as we said at the beginning of the session. So hopefully that's OK. Uh, let me just have a quick look at some questions. How to select chords in a section that's longer than one system? It doesn't work with holding shift. Um, uh, is it Yanis, uh, Yanis Brooker? Um, select one chord um, and then keep pressing um, Command Shift A or Control Shift A if you're on PC. Um, so, for example, if I select one and I do select more, it selects that bar. If I do it again, it selects that system. If I just repeat these chords for a minute in a random way, and you will see what happens. So, Command Shift A, select more. And the, the item is also up here in the menu, so it's, it's this select more option that I'm using. Um, so if I select one, and then it'll select the ones in the bar. If I press the same shortcut again, it does the one in the system. And if I press again, then it does all the way to the end of the flow. Um, so that can often get you uh, exactly what you need, especially if you're working on um, jazz or pop stuff where it's got a four bar section, then actually sometimes just selecting one system is enough. Of course, you can also, you, you, you can drag a box around things like this. Uh, and if you only want the chords, you could set yourself a shortcut for filter chords if you wanted to. Uh, depending on how often you're using these items depends how often you, uh, you want to use them and set a shortcut for things. Um, hopefully that helps. Um, the email is discoverdorico at steinberg.de. So all one word, discoverdorico at steinberg.de. Um, is it possible to hide single bars and only one staff? Only if you're using the, at the moment, only if you're using the option down here for hide empty staves. Um, and if it's a multi-staff instrument like a piano, you might want to tick that box. Um, as well as, of course, setting one of these two options. Um, we don't do kind of cutaway type staves at the moment. Um, as always, watch this space for a unspecified period of time. Um, to get chord symbols to appear below the staff, yeah, there's, um, actually maybe we should do a session on kind of lead sheet options and, and that kind of thing. There is an option in engrave mode about um, between staves as well, if you want that kind of option. Oh, you just reminded me as well. In the uh, Mahler piece, in which version was it? Yes, in this one, rehearsal marks above and below as well. So you might think, oh, I need to look in here in engraving options for rehearsal marks. Um, and this is where I've got numbers on instead of letters. And there's nothing in here about below the bottom of the staff. That's because it's in layout options in the bar numbers section um, where you're showing bar numbers and what you're doing. And then if you scroll down, you can set bar numbers you know, at various places in the staff. But at the very bottom, there's a show rehearsal marks below bottom staff. I don't know why it's there, but it is. So if you need it, then uh, that's where you'll find that one. Um, maybe with the chord stuff, because there's a few questions coming about that, let's 
yeah, let's maybe look at some of those in a in another session. But at the moment, um, I would say uh, select more often gets you where you want to be. Possibly filtering, possibly dragging items like this, uh, dragging a box. You can also, if I hold down uh, Command, I can select other chords like this. Um, so it will it depend on the case, um, but uh, hopefully select more will get you uh, quite a quite a long way because um, that's often what I use for things. The last thing I wanted to show today, uh, now that I've made a mess of this project, is a little bracketed notes. And I know some people said, oh, I can't believe this wasn't added before. Um, so we have a properties panel down here and there's a new section in it for bracketed notes. So you can turn on a bracket random, a bracket random note head. Um, big wow, right. However, of course, um, when we've looked at this as a Dorico option, we've also looked at a few things. So here's a bracket round one individual note head. But sometimes you want to bracket until the end of the tie chain. So here's this option, which then puts the bracket around this bit and this bit in the tie chain, which is very useful. Uh, if I turn that off, for a oh, there is also round and square. So you have a couple of options. If I turn those off for a second, if you've got a chord selected, then you turn on the bracket, then you can get this and it takes the accidentals into account. So instead of just putting, trying to fit in a bracket here, then accidentals are also taken into account, whether they're round or square. Um, you can also break the bracket if you want an individual bracket on each note head. I don't in this case. Uh, and you can say bracket till end of tie chain. So it then gives you this uh, all the way around. So again, apologies, I guess, for not having bracketed note heads before. And I know there were some workarounds people had for that. Um, but as, a, as when we add a feature, we do try and incorporate as much as possible. So there's some other options in it. Um, let me have a quick look at the questions again. Um, the how to get there. I am. Is this version free? Um, some of these items that I've shown actually are in Dorico SE. The condensing options aren't, um, but uh, some of the things we've shown are uh, in the free Dorico SE version. Um, the oh yes, Frank's got a good, good point. If you switch to Galley View, then you only have one line. Um, yes, so you could do that, and then you can drag a box around much more easily. So uh, what Frank means by that is if we switch to galley view, which I was automatically going to do with a shortcut, but I'll show you the view menu galley view. Here we have all the chords, so you can then do this and you can select all the chords with a drag, um, a drag box like that. Uh, actually, that reminds me of something else. If when you normally you get this selection box when you drag in Dorico, if you prefer the hand tool, you can press H for hand tool and you then get a hand tool and you can drag things around. It's this little toggle at the bottom of the screen down here. So you see down here, we've got a, to a toggle between marquee tool, which is this, and the hand tool. Uh, but H is the thing that toggles between the two. Um, but you can temporarily do it as well. So you can temporarily use shift. So I'm currently in marquee, but if I hold down shift, then I can move the score. Or if I'm in move the score mode, I can press shift and I can temporarily drag a box around some chord symbols. Um, so use whichever one you feel is best, depending on whether you have a trackpad or a mouse or uh, whichever pointing device you want to use. Um, it was also pointed out uh, one of the uh, items in Anthony's video this week was that when you're in engraved mode, for example, and you're moving items, so let's say this particular slur, and you're dragging, you can drag all the way around. But if you hold down shift, well you have to do this after you've started dragging. So if I click here to start dragging and then hold down shift, it will constrain. So that if I move left and right or up and down, it will only go up and down or left and right. So shift can be a useful way of constraining things, but only once you've started dragging something, because otherwise you'll get this behavior or you'll get this behavior. So, you know, shift can be used either way around. And there was a question about that. Um, once the, the video had come out, people saying, but hang on a minute. Uh, it, it drags the page around. So hopefully that he helps explain. So we're kind of coming to the end of the session. Um, there are all sorts of other new things in uh, Dorico 3.1, um, which we haven't looked at. So if any of them would be useful and you want to look at them in a, another session, please let me know on our email address, discoverdorico at steinberg.de. They include things like master page sets. You can now import and export your master page templates. Um, we could look at dynamic lanes more. Um, there's a new useful option for remove overlaps when importing MIDI files. So when you're in write mode and you have some notes selected, uh, there's some new edit duration things. So you can extend to next note. Uh, you can shorten to next note, which will remove overlaps. Um, 
You may have noticed if you used Dorico 3.1 already that when you copy and paste a section that already has dynamics in there, then the dynamics will replace. So there's an, it does now does an overwrite when pasting dynamics, uh, which is very useful. Um, the uh, you you may also have noticed when you select items, uh, you might not have noticed, uh, but now when you select items, in fact, if we go back to my larger score, you'll now notice that uh, as you select them, they will feed back the sound that you get. But when you're selecting and editing things, now you use the current dynamic, which is quite nice. So if you're working on a quiet passage, you don't get deafened every time you click on a note. Very useful. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, and also, there's some new things in the XML export that we needed to add. So accidentals, including microtonal accidentals, are now added. Articulations and jazz articulations are now added in the XML export. Uh, chord symbols are now in the XML export. Hooray! And rehearsal marks are all now exported in the XML export as well. So there's some new items there if you are moving the file then to another program. So I'm just going to check the comments, and uh, but we're kind of coming to the end of this session. So let me know if you do have any questions. There will be another Discover Dorico session at the end of February, um, likely the last Wednesday in February. Um, and if you have any questions in the meantime, or uh, this would be useful to look at, um, I have had an example um, from Ben about possibly doing some things with uh, Coral. Um, but it, you know, maybe Dorico SE would also be useful and some of the things in that. Um, maybe something in Dorico Elements and formatting and what you can and can't do, um, please let me know on our email address and we can then uh, plan the next session. Um, let me just have a quick read through the comments. Um, Doug, I'll come back to you about that one. If you think there's a problem with the chord symbols and local chord symbols, I'll have a look. Is there a Discover Dorico that covers orchestral scoring? Um, actually, I think this session, the, the earlier parts of this, were probably the closest we've got to it. So if you've got a good example of the kind of things you would like to look at, uh, Lester, please let me know, um, and I, I'll look at that, no problem. Um, for Hank, as always, yeah, Alt for changing the shape of the slur instead of just the position of any one handle, yes. Um, I miss the ice cream van too, but it's January uh, keys, so we don't tend to get an ice cream van going past here in January. It's a little too cold. Uh, virtual drumline. Ah, Rick, um, get in touch with me because I'm very close now to having something that you should be able to use. Um, maybe that could be another Discover session, but I've been um, working out and remapping the note heads for tenor drums and uh, bass drums and various other things and a new note input method and that kind of thing. So, um, Rick, get in touch with me on our email address, discoverdorico at steinberg.de, um, about drumline, please. Um, oh, Groove Agent. We did use. Um, yes, we could do something on Groove Agent potentially. Um, Patrice, if you want to get in touch with me, then let's have a look at that because it will be it will normally is a case of whether the drum cat is using the standard percussion map or whether we need a percussion map. Um, so that that's the kind of thing we need to look at initially. If the drums you're using are um, so. Well, I'll, I'll just show you. If the drums you're inputting use, for example, the standard. Yamaha XG, then because we use percussion map when we're inputting onto a kit or grid, then uh, you'll get all of the, the right note heads. But if it's using a different percussion map, then you might not. So that's what we need to look into with that one, I think. So if you can let me know some more information, that would be great. Um, and Frank, the bell was there, it's just frozen. It would be at the moment, yes. I mean, all right, it's not as cold here as uh, Canada and lots of other places, but it's still too cold for ice cream right now. Um, official demo projects. There are some official demo projects which get included and installed um, with Dorico. So um, normally they appear in the hub when you first start Dorico. Um, but if, you, uh, I if you've been using various other projects, then they might have disappeared out of there. So uh, you'll find them on your Mac in the library shared folder. Um, let me just find that one for you. Sorry, not library, the users shared folder. Uh, I'll do this. And 
so on my Mac, for example, uh, on my Mac HD in users shared or the equivalent on a PC, there's a, um, a shared area. There's a Dorica example projects and there are some example projects in there. And they include, for example, the, uh, the Akino Akinola Dorico Prelude uh, with condensing. Uh, it includes a piano piece. It includes the Dorico Overture from uh, Dorico One um, that Thomas Hewitt Jones wrote. Um, all lots of very nice pieces that you can have a look at. So yes, have a look at those. Uh, a question is rewire planned in the future um, or something similar. Um, uh, when I've mentioned kind of rewire type things in the past, people have said, oh, don't use rewire. It's, I don't like it. And some people have said, no, I really like it. Um, we are planning to, uh, to do something, I believe, uh, or kind of on the broader scale of integration with Cubase. And of course, then people might want to use Logic. So we are currently investigating things, but no news on that front at the moment. Um, I was showing it again at uh, NAM, dragging MIDI regions in from Cubase and that kind of thing. So there's already a Dorico session uh, where we looked at that on YouTube. Let me know if you want a, a link to that one. Um, Patrice even playing on a MIDI keyboard, I had no sound with Groove Agent. Well, that, that doesn't sound right because you should have. But I'd also check that you do when you use Halion, for example. Uh, that's a good way first to work out, do you have sound if you're using the Halion standard drums? At least then you know things are set up correctly. And then we can work out uh, what the issue is from there. Um, and percussion stickings affect playback. Um, Rick, I think you're asking, it was you're asking about drum lines. So um, there will be a couple of options. You can use the left and right. Uh, there are play playing techniques for left and right. So uh, in the panel over here uh, for percussion, there are L and R. And you can use those to trigger particular sounds if you want. Uh, but what I'm also looking at for drumline is the fact that when you enter the notes, although the left and right note heads would look the same because the player's notes would play differently, if you're using VDL, then you can trigger left and right with different note heads and they will sound correct um, for the percussion stickings. So Rick, again, uh, get in touch and we can talk, uh, talk more about that. I can send you more information hopefully very soon uh, once I've finished this session. Um, for orchestral scoring, I'm looking for tips on divisi writing. Uh, okay, um, Lester, would something like the, I mean, the, the divisi parts of this file at the moment, I am kind of labeling manually. So here's a, um, in this particular score, we do have a divisi feature, but this is kind of a, a separate thing. So for example, here, if I wanted to write um, uh, divisi at this point, what I've actually done in this case is I've added uh, myself a little playing technique for div. Um, so what I can do is in the popover, I can I can type div and I can get uh, the divisi point. But what I've also done is when I created this, I didn't do, just do it as text because it didn't sit in quite the right place for me. So let me just show you that briefly. If I create a new item down here, uh, and let's call this one Bob, um, then I have some text of Bob. If we say Bob dot, then that's what we'll get as the text. Uh, and I can put Bob in the popover. Um, so if I say, for example, here, I now type Bob, then I'll get um, Bob. Um, but if I wanted that to be slightly further left, because it always was kind of you know, left aligned with this, what I did is uh, select him up here and edit. And although at the moment it's text, if you change this to a glyph, then it, it becomes uh, this item. And you can then move it along so that it sits slightly further left. Let's take it a long way left. Let's take Bob a long way left. Um, so now when I, uh, when I enter a Bob, you see he moved. So he's now uh, aligned left over here. So I've made myself a little div and unis um, for those points that I want to mark. But that's completely different from the uh, selecting a staff uh, and using the options in here for change divisi and creating divisi points with solo and uh, glialtri and other uh, players in here. So that's a completely different feature. So it depends which one of those two you want to look at. Maybe that's a, another session we can look at. So thank you. Uh, I better end now because we're getting towards the hour. Um, Paul, where can I find chime sound? Um, normally, again, well, depends what you're using for playback. I'm going to get sidetracked again. Uh, email me. Any more questions? Uh, only because I know people won't want to, uh, to, to, you won't all want the same answers to things. Uh, email me on discoverdorico at steinberg.de uh, and I can answer any other questions on things. 
Um, hopefully this session on new things in Dorico 3.1 was useful. Um, and if you've got any ideas for future things that you want to look at in these sessions, please let me know on the same email address. So thank you all for watching. I'll answer some comments uh, at the end of the stream. Um, but in the meantime, this is now available to watch live uh, later. And please watch the next session, which will be at the end of February. Uh, thank you and see you next time.